that said, I'm just going to find that. Oh, yeah. So now, when your mic is on, you're being on. Okay. Question. Yes. One more question. When I'm playing the audio source, can my mic on just to not get a delay? Uh, no, that's not a. Sh you know what? Good idea. Okay. Just okay. just to be safe. And also, I'm going to just stop the share for one moment. And we're going to reshare. And I want to make sure that something is done. So, uh, audio share. Yes, share audio. Yeah, make sure. You've got it already. Like you are on top of things. Not everybody. <laughs> it's anxiety. <laughs> Yeah. All set. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Gone. <laughs> uh, it's nice to see you all. Thank you for in this snow drift situation. Uh, Happy Lunar New Year to all of you. Almost end of January to welcome you into this, this space. Uh, my name is Maya. Uh, I am uh, coming to you as an person, uh, but in perhaps more solemn capacity team member here in the studio. Uh, and the Sika series has been since 2012, and uh, it is an open platform that welcomes artists, designers, creators, writers, scholars, um, curious and creative folks to share practices not only with the MFA department that funds this series, but also the broader arts community in Jojage. Uh, we are welcoming you into this space, which is where the talks are now traditionally happening Friday, Friday nights, every second Friday in VA114, but I also would like to say an intentional hello to our Zoom audience. Uh, there are any of you in the room as there are on Zoom, so let separate audiences. <laughs> uh, so if anybody on the Zoom has questions at any point, uh, I will be there to welcome your responses, but also especially for the discussion that comes after Lou's remarks, I will be very happy to bring your questions, comments, and curiosities into the room here. Um, so I'm very happy to be hosting this talk as part of Sika, but I also want to bring in a co-host that you may have noticed on our poster and campaign, or if you were in fact at Diagonal last night for Luz Vernissage. Um, I am happy to announce that we are co-sponsoring or co-hosting this event with Diagonal, and I have a few words to read on their behalf, because Gloi Grandot, the artistic director of Diagonal, couldn't be with us in person, but is one of you on Zoom. So, hello, Chloe, ça va? <laughs> uh, so, Diagonal is a center for the dissemination of contemporary art located in the heart of Montreal's dynamic Mile End District. Each year, Diagonal presents a program of exhibitions, research or production residencies, and lectures around its mandate. Approached as a plastic and reflexive object, it is deployed within artistic and theoretical projects by artists, curators, and theorists who are committed to thinking about fiber in terms of matter, concept, or referentiality. This is also the space that will be hosting Lou's work for the next several weeks. Um, Lou's show Three Scores for Dawn and Dusk is up through until mid-March. So do know that you can go and see some of the work that Lou will be discussing in person in that space. Um, uh, just a few running order remarks before I then introduce Lou and hand over the microphone, almost literally, um, that uh, we will be in a sort of artist talk capacity for um, the next 45 minutes or so, at which point we then will shift pivot into an open Q&A. Uh, you're very welcome to bring your voices into the room at that point. And we will also be trudging uh, snowshoeing up to Grumpy's for a drink and some Sika sponsored pizza. So if you would like to join us um, and talk a bit more with Lou about his practice, that's very welcome. 
Um, we are doing all of tonight's activities, um, especially, you know, uh, thinking about gathering here on Zoom, but also in this space um, on unceded land. And whilst this is the 10th year of Stika, 10 years sometimes feels like an anniversary number worth celebrating, um, gathering to discuss cultural, political, economic acts of sovereignty has been taking place on Jojagi for millennia. So let's remember the, the heritage and precedence of Indigenous sovereignty on these lands before we continue with our, with our own proceedings in this space. So now on to Lou, why we are here. <clears throat> Lou Shepard's work is responsive, investigating the material and discursive context of a site and their affect on bodies and environments. His research is evidenced through graphic notations, scripts, and scores, which are then performed in collaboration with other artists and in community gatherings. Lou is a settler on the traditional and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq in Mi'kmaq, Nova Scotia. And rather than go through the many accolades and points of exhibition and opportunity and um, critical discourse that Lou is engaged in, uh, I have just chosen a short list of things that Lou is doing also right now. So this gives you a bit of, an ex of a sense of how busy Lou is. In addition to being here and having the show at Diagonal, Lou has a three-act drag and choral performance on show at the Art Gallery of uh, York University. So if any of you are in Tagoronto, you can go and see that. Oh, it just closed. Damn it. That's true. We were talking about this last night. Um, you can learn about it on the web cache uh, and ask Lou in the Q&A. Uh, I can't keep up. So two more things. Um, work in the Public Art Commission at Broadway Subway Project in Vancouver. And after this, catching a plane to go to Winnipeg, uh, where Lou is participating in um, the Stages 2023 Biennale. So uh, Lou is busy. Let's pass him the microphone so he can get on with the talk. Uh, thank you again for joining us. And Lou, I welcome you to the spotlight. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, OK. Yeah. Oh, yes. It's also pink. Oh, that was, I mean, it wouldn't be the worst thing. Uh, so thank you so much for coming. I am able to be heard. I'm all, all good. Um, yeah, I'm really happy to be here. I, I, it's funny to to talk about being really busy because I think that's something as artists and as people that are engaged in kind of this like weird world that we're all sort of working in, uh, it's something that we kind of need to talk about and talk about our professional boundaries and our ability to like navigate uh, precarity in the arts and and how it is that we actually like make a life in this world rather than just like burn ourselves out. Um, and that's something that I'm thinking a lot about at this point in my career where I'm say a few years in and uh, and wanting to, yeah, wanting to think about like what it means to be an artist for my life and, uh, and how I can do that. Um, so that's something we can talk about afterwards. I, I don't have a lot of thoughts about it yet, but it's on my mind. Um, I am from, as Maya said, I'm from Nova Scotia. I grew up in Nova Scotia. I am of Scottish, Irish, and English ancestry. I burn very easily in the sun. Uh, and as I was growing up, I, um, as a, a person of Scottish and English and Irish ancestry, living in Nova Scotia made a lot of sense to me. Um, I, and I would hear sort of my like, my ancestral music played around me and that was what was celebrated in the tourism commercials. Um, and it gave me a way of understanding my place in land that was very much about like, like sort of, uh, you know, here I am, like here I am in, in New Scotland and as this sort of like continuation of, of old Scotland. Um, and when I started to understand that Nova Scotia was not this land's only name, that it also carries, I mean, it carries many names and one of the names is Mi'kma'ki. Um, I started to understand the ways that names and place, like uh, names that we give places shift our relationships to those places. Uh, and so on Nova Scotia, I have this kind of ownership or this sort of like, like this sort of lineage. And in Mi'kma'ki, I'm, I'm positioned as a settler, as a, you know, as a, a my ancestors as colonizers and, and as somebody who is, in fact, now deed holder to unceded land, or like in some, in some ways that I'm, I'm owning stolen property, which is um, 
really weird and interesting to think about and something that I do think a lot about in my work. But I wanted to bring that up and just show you where I live just as a way of kind of, this is so much about where my practice comes from and like what what kind of drives me in my work is thinking about my relationship to place and the ways that I experience place and the ways that we can experience place through language and the ways that we can engage with material and matter. Um, and so this is this is where I live on the south shore of Mi'kmaq, Nova Scotia. But um, continuing that thought about like what it means to what it means to kind of actually. Uh, yeah, to really like try to think through what it means to uh, be on unceded territory or be on be in relation to a treaty and what it means to kind of like try to try to engage with a treaty. Uh, you'll probably recognize the Banff Center for the Arts. I was there doing a residency a few years ago and I um, I got really curious because like at the beginning of every Banff Center program, they they come out and they go like we're on Treaty 7 territory and they do their like very standard uh, land acknowledgement, which is, you know, it has it, it has a role, uh, but I was like, okay, well, what is Treaty Seven, and like, what does it mean as we start to talk about Treaty Seven, um, and what are we kind of invoking, and like, what are we imagining or like remembering when we talk about Treaty Seven? So this was a a performance that I uh, I organized where we read Treaty Seven aloud, um, and so you can see people are kind of stumbling through it, and as you might imagine, it's like a fairly uh, dense document um, that is like now now reading it from like a, a current lens is like it's quite problematic and I'm reading through it and it's all this sort of like vague allusions to like boundaries and land and the queen owning this and and this land just being signed over um, and as I was researching the treaty I also came across this book that was called the true spirit and intent of treaty seven and it was written by talking to elders from the um, different nations that had uh, that had signed into Treaty Seven, and what struck me was that uh, what the elders sort of like collectively were saying about Treaty Seven is that it was a peace a peace treaty, and was not about land surrender. So even though the treaty itself, as a legal document, is this land surrender document, that wasn't how it was interpreted um, among the indigenous nations that signed it. And so they remembered that they had agreed to share the land with the newcomers in exchange for certain privileges, uh, which is very different than what is being said um, on the treaty that was signed. Uh, and the thing that I find, like beyond this just being like something to really think about in terms of, you know, what does it mean to, well, what, you know, like what, how are we dealing with land in Canada and like, what does it mean? And um, I think for me, what gets really interesting is this idea of, of two kind of, um, uh, systems of what is the word I'm looking for like two two language systems that actually don't uh they don't translate fluidly so it's not as though there's like an easy translation between English and and these indigenous languages and and that was part of the issue is that this document could not be translated from English and so and so it was kind of just signed in good faith and um and now as we're starting to kind of understand the gaps and like the sort of like gaps in the translation that that were there, what does that actually mean to talk about these treaties? I guess that's something that I think a lot about in my work and just wanting in this talk to kind of talk a little bit more about what's driving my practice or sort of what's behind it. And this kind of question around like, how do we reconcile um, different linguistic systems and different kind of like different ways of thinking and different ways of experiencing um, is really like something that I come back to again and again. So that being said, uh, this is like just a little reference point. I started down this this kind of pathway of thinking about land and language, um, and I was able to kind of like through, just like through dumb luck, I was able to get on a boat to Antarctica um, with a group of artists called the Antarctic Biennial. Uh, I implied through an open call wild that it happened that I was like taken in and they took me to Antarctica with them um so here I was in Antarctica thinking about this question of like what does it mean to be on this like land mass that is so much held in a kind of collective imaginary and so much held 
in a collective imaginary in relation to like the fragility of our planet and like climate change, you know, and we always kind of talk about like Antarctica is melting and like that's the that's how we know that things are like really bad is that we're losing all of this ice and we're losing all of this sort of the this space. Um, and of course, you know, behind that is this kind of question around like what is it that we hold so dear about Antarctica and like why is it this kind of why do we hold it as this sort of like pure space or this sort of like un, uninhabited space or uninhabited by human space and like what is it that is so important about that to our um, collective imaginary uh, questions I'm asking myself all the time but really thinking about like how do we get to know a place like this and like what is it like what languages do we have to access this place so uh, so I wanted to kind of takes for me the way that I could sort of think about Antarctica was through like a lot of scientific data that was kind of coming out around climate change questions and like this idea that ice shelves were breaking off um, and also this kind of like homoerotic uh, I shouldn't say that just off the top this sort of adventure myth that I also read as really homoerotic um, but you know the kind of like tales of like great adventure that were people are running there and running their ships aground and all that happened um so i wanted to think about like uh that language of scientific inquiry and that kind of like positioning of antarctica is this sort of this sort of place of scientific um like 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 that our sort of like understanding of it was so much through this kind of like scientific language and this kind of like mapping and like this sort of uh this sort of like over overhead assessment and like like sort of uh yeah, like looking at it from from a bird's eye perspective. Uh, and so I took the coastline itself, which of course is changing in relation to um, in relation to like climate change. And I uh, translated it into a musical notation. And so this is like an old piece for me. And I think it's like it, it's kind of a, a good place to kind of just to kind of touch on to say like, you know, a lot of these things that I think about in my work, that they come from this idea of metaphor, or this idea of translation, or this kind of idea of laying two things beside each other and seeing what happens. So this was the first score that I ever made. Um, I studied music as a kid, but I didn't, I, I'm not a musician. I, but I know enough music to know how to kind of translate this out as a piano piece. And so uh, that's what I did. Um, and it became this kind of, yeah, it became this kind of odd, uh, this like odd sort of huge expansive piece that was trying to, um, yeah, trying to kind of like listen to the, the dissonance of the, this language that we had to talk about Antarctica and the experience of being there itself. So this piece was called Requiem for the Antarctic Coast. Um, and uh, this is like one piece of, I think like 40, pieces of a score and this is like how um scrappy I used to be as an artist I literally had them and I had I was showing them in um in Venice and they were literally like ripped from this roll of paper and just like jagged ends with like you know phone numbers written in the side and everything because it was such a, a project that was really just about my own process so um here's a, a piece of that uh, and then this is also an older piece, but also a good kind of starting starting point for what I'm thinking about now. Um, a couple of, oh, may, I mean, quite a few years ago now, I was uh, in, a, in a similar way, I was seeking not only to kind of think about the language that I was talking about land with, uh, but I also wanted to think about the language that I was talking about my own body and my own identity with. And so I wanted, uh, I was like seeking medical uh like medical transition i was going to my doctor to be like i want to start taking hormones i want to start like thinking about having surgery um and to do that i needed a diagnosis um and so i needed a i needed a diagnosis that actually comes from the the dsm uh which if you're not familiar with it's the diagnostic statistical manual i was working with volume five um and it it is a a compendium of of mental disorders and and stresses and I can't remember how they say it and it's like all the language shifts like every year and it's it's quite an interesting document because it's a way of actually kind of cataloging all of these things that in in lots of ways are identities um and so gender dysphoria is how there's a diagnosis I was seeking um as an acute stressor 
and it uh, it's described here in the in the DSM, and this is the document, the kind of like standard working document that any WPATH um, practitioner is working with as they assess their clients for readiness for hormones and for surgery. So if any of you are familiar with this process, you're probably familiar with a text something like this. Um, and the reason I knew about this is because this is a, a text, not the text itself, but the kind of key points in the text are passed along the trans community as saying, this is how you get in. This is like, you got to tell this story. This is a story that you'll tell to, to the psychiatrist who will then say, yeah, okay, you're trans. Um, and so it's this like kind of amazing fabrication that happens where you're like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to render myself legible um, under this diagnosis, and then this diagnosis is going to allow myself to render myself legible to my own self. You know, like it's just this kind of like, like wacky, and really problematic and hurtful process, as you can imagine. Um, and so, if you look at the text repeated again and again, like I mean, obviously it's it's, and it's interesting to look at it now. I think when I started this piece was in 2017, 2016. So it was like our understanding of gender was also really different as a society, I think. Now I feel like everybody looks at this and goes like, this isn't really how we think about gender any anymore maybe. But if you look at it, it's this kind of like, <laughs> they're really trying not to say like, you just wanna be a boy or you just wanna be a girl, but that's basically how they're shaking it out. Uh, but I, I like this um, repeat, repeat of a strong desire and this kind of like repeated, uh, that's how they'll assess is if you have a strong desire for uh, primary or secondary sexual characteristics of the other or another gender, um, a strong desire to be treated as the gender different from one's assigned gender. And this idea of a strong desire being this kind of like assessment that was being made of my identity and experience. So I wanted to think about that text and I wanted to think about um, the spaces of that text that were sort of the non-spaces, the negative spaces, the spaces that maybe had a bit of breathing room, had some queer, had some space for kind of queer identity, uh, and also the spaces that were not uh, translated to a body, the spaces of like kind of, yeah, the, the, the spaces that weren't actually actively constructing a body, but that had this kind of, uh, where there were maybe these spaces of possibility. And so I took, um, this is a kind of a close up, but I took the text itself and then, uh, I notated it with a dance notation um, because I wanted to think about like what, you know, what possibilities of movement are in this space and like what could kind of happen here. So this is um, the score that shook out from that. Uh, it's using a dance notation called Laban notation. I'm not going to get into it. I'm really interested in languages and like notation systems. I think there's like a, you're doing a class that's similar to this, but um, Laban notation has its own history and like it's a fascinating dance notation. Uh, but I like it because it is so graphic and uh, because it is really accessible for non dancers because it's actually talking about things like raise your right arm, like put your left leg back. And so it's this very straightforward dance notation. Um, and so that's the score. And then I, I translated it to English as best I could. And so here is this kind of like all of the movements that come out of that space of, of uh, uh, the negative spaces in that text. And then this is a first, a first sort of uh, iteration of this piece with Lily Davis, who's a dancer um, and a non-binary dancer. And, uh, and I'll just show you a short clip of them kind of working through this score. And in the background, you can hear this. Uh, I took my my breaths and sort of cut them. So as I was reading the text, and they cut cut the breaths, so that it was kind of those trying to kind of bring those spaces audibly into the piece as well. So it's a little bit heavy breathing. Uh, I just have to press it like this. <laughs> Thank you. 
can you hear me again? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So uh, that was just a first, like a first iteration. And one thing about my work uh, that is maybe relatable is that I tend to, I don't, I don't have pieces that sh like really easily ship from place to place, exhibition to exhibition, but I tend to work in iterations of projects. And because they're performance projects, I'm able to change them in relation to each site that I'm working in. So that original project was at the Kyber Center for the Arts in Halifax. It was my first solo exhibition um, or like sort of first and first, you know, funded exhibition, all that stuff. Um, and then this was a, a couple of years later at Simon Fraser University and wanting to work through that same score again um, and wanting to work through it with my own body and wanting to really think about rather than these very constrained movements of Laban notation that you saw Lili performing where there's this kind of like resistance in their body and they're sort of like they're moving through these this quite like formal uh, movement piece. I really wanted to think about kind of all of the possibilities of movement that were that were kind of uh, translated out of that document. And so this is a, a piece that I this is the performance of that piece and I had my I, I was trying to figure out like how do you show movement without just like straight up videoing it on a camera and like putting it in the gallery. Um, and so I have worked a few times with this idea of like tracing movement through charcoal. It's messy, but uh, you know, I think it's it's quite interesting because then you kind of have this sense of movement, but you also uh, you also have this kind of like another iteration of a score. So this uh, the trace itself becomes like a score for future movements, or becomes like something that could be reperformed. And so it's just this kind of like bouncing score on score on score that happens in the in the gallery space. Um, I really wanted Jim Matt uh, for this piece and. Uh, it's kind of sometimes you get stuck into places where you're like, oh, I'm going to ask for this thing of the curator and the curator is going to like be like, sure. And then, you know, be like, this is really hard <laughs> to get. And, uh, you know, you have to know when to kind of like uh, you have to know when to say like, OK, I can compromise. And you have to know when you really need to stick to your vision. And this is one of those places where I was just like, we really need gym mats because I wanted student. It was in a student gallery or like a university and I really wanted the students to be able to come into this space take their shoes off and just like hang out in this like theoretical space of like questioning gender or this like space sort of outside of outside of gender this like kind of like expanded space where where there could just be like a, a kind of like moment um, and also just really wanting to think about bodies in gallery spaces and like disrupting gallery spaces and active in gallery spaces so that was uh, the last time I've showed that work um, a strong desire. And I'm not going to go too far into this piece, but it's quite similar. The piece that you'll see if you head up to Diagonal called Pas de Deux, which similarly takes the text, uh, text definitions for a man and woman and um, thinks of them as a kind of boundary. And you can see like the shape of these definitions are taken, like, the definitions are taken from a dictionary, the Cambridge Dictionary. Um, and then I've translated these movements. Um, kind of along the edges of those of that text um, to kind of think about the idea of these margins or these sort of like marginal spaces and what it like what queer possibilities are there what it means to activate that space what it means to encounter um, a kind of boundary of of language as a queer person um, and like how how our bodies kind of move in relation to that and contort in relation to that so this is uh pas de deux, which is up at uh, Diagonal and uh, this is Kizis and Winnie Ho, who are two local uh, non binary trans dancers um, working in the space. Um, and so it was really, yeah, it, it, really great to be able to come into a city where, like, I, it's not my city and be able to find these dancers and to actually really engage and, like, get to make this work with them. Um, and it's a hard way, like, this piece was not, it didn't exist on Monday. Uh, and then it existed on Thursday night, you know, like it's like it's a, it's an intense way of working because but I think there's something that bringing that freshness to every time the work is shown that it's like shown in relation to this space and like sort of like with people who are like kind of thinking about it again and like always kind of going back to these ideas and and thinking through them in different ways um, is really central to how I'm how I'm working. Um, just in the interest of time, I'm going to maybe just. Uh, this is another piece that is up at Diagonal, and it is about uh, 
it's about scoring bird song and like similarly thinking about the language that we have to capture bird song and like sort of this question around loss of language, loss of sound in our environment and wanting to hold um, or think about how we can like notate that sound. Uh, and so this piece, um, I'll just kind of skip through it quickly, but it is a, a, a question of like how we notate that sound and like how we might remember it. Um, but I wanted to get to the part where I'm talking a little bit about my research. So, um, so this question of score has become really central to my practice and this like idea of what it means to um, what it means to kind of engage with with a score and what a score can do. So a score for me is this kind of like it's an expanded maybe expanded way of thinking about it than say like music notes on a page but i'm really thinking about the way that we can hold time and space um through a score and like it can it can hold a kind of moment and you know score has this like lovely meaning of like of, of a set of instructions but it also has this lovely meaning of an incision or a kind of cut and i think a lot about the way that scores almost fold a kind of past and present together where they hold that past and present at the same time um, so that's been like, so I come back to this idea of score again and again and again with my work of wanting to kind of create these, like hold these times and spaces and hold these ideas and hold the ways that things work um, and the way that language works and the way that, that uh, language is, I guess, operating in relation to the material it describes. Um, and so I went, I wanted to think about scores and notations in relation to an archive. Um, and I was invited by a curator in Nova Scotia named Robin Metcalf into his kind of personal archives um, and uh, to like really look through what, what was in there and then create some work in response to it. Um, and I really started thinking about the idea that an archive itself is a kind of score or it's a collection of score. It's a collection of notations. It's a collection of records and that those notations could be re played or reimagined and rethought. This is an article I came across that was really striking. Um, this is uh, Wilson Hodder, who is a, a quite well-known queer activist in Canada, who was known, uh, he was the person that got same-sex unions recognized under the Canadian Pension Plan. Um, and he did that because his partner died of complications due to AIDS, and uh, he was also dying of complications due to AIDS and needed that pension to live. Um, and, and so um, among wanting to, I mean, among other things, and he's a, it's a kind of incredible figure. He lived in Halifax. And this is a conversation that's uh, sort of transcribed by another queer icon who we just lost, Jane Kansas, who if you've, yeah, if you ever dig into the archives of the CBC, you'll hear Jane's voice. And she's this sort of amazing, hilarious thinker. But um, Jane was interviewing Wilson Hodder uh, on his deathbed and talking about this question of like, I mean, not really his legacy, but just talking about what it is to be in that liminal space between life and death. And I think like a testament to queer people that like th that this interview is itself so queer because it's really just like dealing with the facts at hand and really trying to be like, here we are and like, let's name the things that are that are in front of us. And so um, there's a moment in here where where Jane asks, um, does time go by strangely? And Wilson answer, answers, time is standing still, which I just um, love because, not only because I think it is just uh, like so poetic, but because it speaks to this question of queer time and this idea of folding time and this idea that, you know, that um, understanding queer bodies as existing outside of a, a sort of heteronormative temporal structure so akin to this piece, I also found a, an article that I don't have an image of, but it was like kind of written about a Halifax area mayor who in, during the AIDS crisis um, in Halifax talked about wanting to send people with AIDS to Sable Island. And if you know Sable Island, it's like 200 kilometers off of the coast of uh, Nova Scotia. And it's this kind of sandbar where there's wild ponies, nothing else, maybe a scientific research station. Um, and so he was just like, we should just send them all to Sable Island uh, when asked like how he was gonna support people with AIDS. And, uh, and so 
you know, this is like not, he's not the only one to say this, you know, there was like lots of talk uh, in the 80s about just quarantining and forgetting about people with AIDS. Um, and so this piece I made uh, thinking about that idea of uh, a queer commune, a queer hospice, a kind of non-space, a utopia on Sable Island um, and the ways and, and what it might feel like to be there. So this is a video work and I just had three stills from it. And so you can see the text that I referenced in, um, in that interview. Um, in the video work. And then this is the, the work installed at St. Mary's Gallery. Um, and I had my friends sleep on sheets uh, and it was kind of in the middle of the COVID pandemic. So it was also really like charged to do anything with bed linens, but I, I had them sleep on these sheets for a series of nights. Um, and then I brought them dirty into the gallery and had them in these sort of piles. Um, and just like really wanting to bring the idea of like, of of queer bodies and queer and you know like the idea of like queerness as toxicity or like queerness is like that fear of, of queer bodies into a into a gallery space. Um, the text that you're seeing at the on the video here is this text. Uh, the other text that I brought into the video piece, which were play directions on a play about the Toronto bathhouse raids and this sort of like at a similar time this sort of like uh, imagining of like a queer like a queer narrative. Um, and so the, 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 uh, the stage directions are all like kind of setting up a, a scene for cruising or like kind of setting up a scene like in a bar about like kind of these men like eyeballing each other and walking by each other and sort of having these moments. So that is that piece is called Send Them All to Sable Island. And it was part of this larger show called Phase Variations. Uh, and it was all of this research about like sort of coming from this uh, archive and and thinking there was the first time that I had really like dug into an archive as a space for research. And if people are doing that in your practice, I'm like super curious to talk to you about it because I think it's it's such a I mean, there's so many artists who do turn to archives. And I think artists are often asked to turn to archives because uh, we don't know exactly what to do with them and we don't know how to make sense of them. Um, and yeah, just I really love the idea that we can think of them as things to be reperformed, to re-engaged with. Um, just a, like a quick note on this piece, as part of face variations, this was a set of stairs um, that I built, uh, and you can see it says acting on the front. And then if you walk up the stairs to stand on the top of it or sit on the top of it, because you know, uh, there's this kind of like story in Toronto about the the steps and Church Street. I, this is like all just like old nerdy queer knowledge, but there's these steps, everybody sat on them. It was like where you where you sat to meet people. They were in front of the second cup. Um, anyways, uh, so these steps, and when you sat on the steps, you looked down and saw the word looking. And then when you were standing in the gallery space, looking at the steps, you saw the word acting. And so this piece was called Queer Bind and like thinking again about this idea of, of uh, our positions and our positions in relation to like our identities. And so this idea that you might like, like when you are, when you were looking at somebody, this idea of like sort of like being positioned that you always have to kind of act a certain role of queerness. And then when you are looking out at the world, you are also sort of uh, marginalized in that queerness. And so we are kind of like on stage and then also, also marginalized on that stage. Um, so, uh, but I wanted to show this piece because this was like a sort of, this has been a new trend in my work or like a thing that I'm really thinking about, about making this kind of like furniture in the gallery space where people can sit or like engage and that people's bodies start to perform the work itself. So that it's, you know, that the work, that the, the pieces actually become scores that bodies have to interact with. Um, I saw some work, like I've seen, I've seen, I'm sort of like drawing on a history of artists working in that way and kind of, like thinking about what it means to ask a body to implicate itself in a in a gallery space, um, and and yeah, it's been something that I've thought a lot about in the past little bit. So that that piece, uh, yeah, just to kind of say that and to kind of talk about that as a theme in my work. But um, part of what I did here uh, at this show, I was working with a younger curator, and uh, she, uh, I asked her to kind of curate the reading room for the, um, 
so I was working with a, a senior curator and then there was this sort of, you know, like an intern um, and was really, who was really interested in the show. And so I was like, well, what if you, cur you curate this reading room? And I just love what she did, Undine Folds. She like created this <laughs> amazing wall of old show posters, which are just like heaven to look at. And then all of these documents, like, and so I, as an accompaniment to the show itself, sorry, yeah, this reading room exists. And so that's another way of kind of, like asking like what a gallery can be and like sort of like just pushing those boundaries of, of, uh, of you know, what constitutes an exhibition, I guess. Um, last piece that I'm gonna talk about as we're sort of at time, I think. Um, this is a piece that Maya mentioned, the, it's called Rites of Passage. And it was again, a kind of extended research into Toronto's river systems. Um, and ravine systems. This is Michael Miranda, who is the curator of the, of the piece at Art Gallery of York University. Um, and we're like literally trying to follow this creek called Lavender Creek uh, through the city. It's kind of up in the Toronto stockyards, if you know Toronto at all. Um, and uh, we wanted to try to sort of follow it and just find it because it was quite hidden from us. Um, and so this piece, uh, became this kind of, this is like an install shot of the piece, but it became this kind of like extended exploration of these rivers and the question around, um, this question around riparian rights of rivers. And so what does it mean for water? Uh, water, ha people have a right, there's, it's complicated, but <laughs> basically people have a right to travel around, along navigable water. The Don River, I believe is a navigable river. So, so there's a right of people to travel along that water. And if you're a property owner, you can own, you own like, like the banks of the river to the high tide or like the high like sort of watermark, but you don't actually own the water itself. Um, some, sometimes in the United States, you can own the riverbed. There's like, you'll hear, there's like a lot of debates going on about like, do I own the riverbed? Um, because as rivers start to kind of dry up and shift, it's like suddenly that becomes usable land. Uh, but if people have that right to travel along those waterways, then the water itself has a right to travel because it's like inherent in the right of the person. Um, and so I was really thinking of this question of like, what is the relationship between Toronto as an urban space and these rivers and like the kind of rights of movement along and through them and who moves along the rivers in Toronto and, and, uh, and who is sort of like occupying those spaces. and these kind of high and low watermarks become these sort of ambiguous queer spaces or queered spaces that that become sort of questioned in in uh, like questionable in terms of like where does that space belong so the you can see these benches are um built in the gallery as like sort of seating they also mimic this concretized river structure that is throughout toronto and, uh, and then the cloths that are hanging are sensitized to light. Um, so they're kind of captured in the river spaces and they're, they're sensitized with photosynthesis chemicals. So you take plants called an anthotype. Uh, if you're in like cameraless photography, you'll be, you'll know about this. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's kind of like capturing and gathering the light and it's like all plant material. But uh, I'll just, show you. So I had the, the piece was kind of populated by these three drag performers. Um, and I wanted to, I wanted to work with drag in this piece because I really wanted to think about um, this idea of like, uh, I guess like, what does it mean to sort of like drag human or sort of like, like, so I had these three performers who I, I gave the instructions that they were to imagine themselves as plants that were dragging humans. Um, and so on the on the far left, you have turkey tail fungus, and this is Tess Martin's performing as turkey tail fungus. And then in the center, Wayne Burns performing as algae, and then King Chella, um, who has like since become a bit of a, a TV sensation, um, <laughs> performing as hogweed. And I, I took these three plants because they have these kind of interesting roles in the river system. So mushrooms being this decomposer, algae being this kind of rebuilder and hogweed, giant hogweed being this kind of like amazing uh, spreader throughout those spaces. So here's the three of them. And the piece was, uh, the piece that they were performing was this uh, imagined kind of 
Greek tragedy, or like I was kind of using the structure of a Greek tragedy, tragedy to write it. And, uh, and it was all written with an uh, AI, like a Jasper AI, like a, like a chatbot, you know? So I wrote it, I, I kind of, because I really wanted also to have this uh, idea of like, I was really questioning these kind of boundaries between like where do humans begin and end in the city and like what is like are, is this a space to kind of think about like post-human space or like non-human space or like more than human space and so I, I didn't want to like direct the the writing myself and so this is a piece that I wrote yeah I kind of like edited it from this extended conversation with a chatbot and it's like a several it's a bunch of yeah it's it, the entire performance is an hour this is part of it and you can kind of see it's this like looping conversation about these boundaries and these spaces um, and like what it means to kind of be in those spaces. Uh, this is, yeah. So I'll just show you like a very short clip from the work. It was, I should say also, just so you are oriented to it when you look at it here, behind it, what each of these stations um, is a speaker and each speaker has a different channel of audio. Each speaker has a, a chorus member's voice. And so they're singing into the space. Um, and so when you hear that, you'll hear the chorus in the background of this piece. And it's just the last little. The water mm -hmm. Can you smell it? Mm -hmm. Welcome to my nightmare, everyone! <laughs> Stuck in a groundhog-esque time loop, reliving the same disasters over and over again. Sometimes me. It was hard to remember when everything was so different. It was easy to forget. Is it back on? Sorry. 
Sorry, Zoom. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> no, it's okay. Yeah, I just was, I wasn't saying anything important. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah um yeah so i don't know how yeah i'm happy yeah let's talk yeah okay <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Should I sh stop sharing my screen? Um, how about you put it up to that wonderful image you started with? Okay. And then just in case we need images, we can go back to them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it's it's like older work, so I'm always like, eh, yeah. I don't know if this one was one that you were. Saying. I, yeah, I think I started sort of whizzing here. I'll leave it there. Yeah, that was my fault because I think I encouraged you to talk about research. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, did did you want to say anything more about this piece? Because I, I have a yeah. No, you could ahead. yeah question yeah. Um, I have a question just to help us ease into the pivot from being active listeners to active question askers. And it was something you said right around this time, but maybe not specifically about this piece. And it had to do with the way that you think about score in an expanded sense. And also, I mean, I really got into my notes and my feelings while you were talking about this. So I'm probably going to paraphrase incorrectly, but the possibility of score being like an invitation, especially when it's then embodied, and how you also have an ethics of um, allowing scores to happen again and again and differently, and that's part of their manifestation. And then when work travels, you have a particular politic of uh, collaborating, collaborating with people who are local to the space in which you're working. Yeah, when I can, yeah. When you can. Yeah. Yeah. And I would love it if you would be willing to talk a little bit more about that process, even in the practical aspect, kind of looping up to the beginning of our chat, where there was a little bit of discussion about the ethics of like work and labor, because <laughs> that's collective work. But then also, I mean, there's the practicality aspect of that. But then there's also like the 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 beauty of that and the aesthetic of that and how a score comes from one place and can manifest in so many ways, which is such a queer manifestation of the score. So I wonder if maybe we could go back to that moment. Yeah. And then also we can bring yeah. in other questions. Well, OK, maybe a, a long like a sort of like starting point is to say that I started out as a uh, in in at Concordia, I started studying theater and development, like many many years ago. And I've always kind of thought of myself as a like I, I've thought about performance, and I think about like when I think about making work, I always think of the theatricality of it. And you can probably see that like my work is quite theatrical. I'm often like referencing stage design and like all of this kind of thing, which is to say that like I really love this idea of like creating spaces. Um, and to creating uh, spaces that people navigate and move through and that and spaces that um, are active in themselves and you know for for worse um, and uh, and so when I get invited into a space I often want to start sort of fresh there and say like what can I like I want to bring my my sort of scores into it and then say how can I um, yeah, how can this score kind of happen in this space? So, you know, even with Diagonal, like some of that work that, that is currently on view is like stuff that I, I brought in, I kind of like packed it up from my studio and shifted in. Um, and I brought in the scores themselves, but I really wanted the space to feel like it had been performed in. And that like, there's this kind of like idea of action in it, um, which is, can be kind of like an intense way of working, but I think also like, you know, in some ways, it's also just like how as performers, like we work. Um, and so this score is what is, uh, is part of part of what is being performed at Diagonal. Um, and it's called Crepuscular Rhythms. 
Uh, and it was again in a way of think like kind of like holding or diagramming time and space and particularly diagramming dawn and dusk and like notating the space of dawn and dusk. Um, and so the score at Diagonal is performed by these t-shirts um, which are hung uh, on the walls and those t-shirts have been light sensitized and then worn I wore them on these like series of walks through dawn and dusk in the neighborhood that I was living in Brooklyn at the time um and uh I wanted to kind of gather that light and then bring that kind of like active the idea of like bringing the light itself like into the gallery or the sort of record of the light into the gallery and so in some ways the t-shirts the then become scores of the light you know like they become these kind of records of the light and it's just this sort of I think it's just this way of kind of thinking about record and like the way that record is always kind of uh, asking for a new a new performance or a new iteration um so yeah that's that's part of it um and part of it is also just really practical because i uh i i don't think i i don't document my work in sort of standard ways the rites of passage piece was the first time that i'd really like made a full i mean it's like it's a it's a big like opera basically and i and i made it with the idea that it felt like you were in a performance space that was live um, but of course, now I do have this documentation of all of these different performances that happened. But so often it's like, I have to perform to actually create the documentation in a space. Like, you know, I don't have, like when you think of the Strong Desire piece, like that is drawn on the wall, but it's like a result of a action that's happened. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of like how that, how that works. And it is, uh, it's just different. It's a different way of working, I guess, in some ways, but yeah. That anticipate well answered a question that came up on the Zoom from one of our grad students. Um, Radiki was asking about your methodology and how a new project arises and how does it evolve in your experience. Yeah. So it seems like it often starts score-ish and then goes through permutations as you're working with and through it. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll just yeah I'll just zoom ahead to some of the like research shots that I have because this is a thing that I'm thinking about. Um, yeah, this is a sort of interesting. So, so my work, it kind of begins with research. Um, you know, you kind of get like a tug on an idea and you're like, oh, wait, like I'm sort of, I'm being like pulled in this direction or like I'm starting to think about this thing. For example, I'm going to Winnipeg to do a site visit. And I asked them if I could see some like mine spaces or sort of quarry spaces. And then they were like, hey, we have this old bank building. Are you interested in seeing that? And suddenly I'm just like, okay, the piece starts to kind of like come together from, from those ideas and like responding to the idea that I could, I could make something that has a relationship between like a kind of extracted space and then a space that's built on the wealth of that extraction. And so, and so I start to kind of research and like my research is often really related to the space and like related to, so in Toronto, for example, when I was doing this rites of passage piece, all of the scores that the choir were singing were based on historical maps of Toronto and the kind of development of Toronto around the river systems and the way the river systems had been shifted. And so I'll just, uh, if we go back, um, yeah, the, you can see the, so the scores are printed here. They're actually printed on silk, uh, just as mm. like an aside. That's a very hard medium to work on. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can see it's like a little bit, uh, yeah, it's a little funny in the shot. But um, yeah, so these all these scores are what the choir is performing, but they are all based on, uh, yeah, like historic riverway, waterways, uh, pathways of glacial movement, like uh, original roads, um, the relationship between the Don Valley Parkway and the Don Valley, mm -hmm. like the Don River. And then the last one is based on the Navigable Waters Act. And so it's like this kind of sprawling research that I do where I'm really looking at like maps and histories and like looking for stories and looking for ways in to kind of talk about this relationships that I'm trying to kind of, yeah, that I'm trying to explore. Um, and that's where the scores come from. It's like, mm -hmm. that, it's like diagramming that research or notating that research or trying to hold the stories that I'm talking about. So the crepuscular rhythm score, for example, I can hear my voice getting louder when I look down. So I'm like wondering if I should do this. Um, yeah, this score. Uh, so yeah, the, this score came out of a conversation about dawn and dusk with another queer person about feeling safer to, to move around the city at dawn and dusk, you know, that, that those times of day felt safer. Um, and, I, and so I was really thinking about that idea from that conversation and then this idea that they could be like queer queer spaces or like queer moments in the day that they are like 
that they, they do become these kind of expanded moments or these like spaces of like they are mar they are like within the margins of the day, you know, for example. Mm -hmm. And so the score tried to notate that space and I notated it by looking at the actual like technical angles that uh, that the, the sun occupies in relation to the horizon to like determine when dawn and dusk come about. Um, and so that that score itself, like it becomes like a way of like kind of holding that space and then uh, and then the performances of it become ways of activating the space that's held by that score. So, yeah, hmm. I think hope that, that makes sense. Yeah, hope absolutely. And I don't mean to complicate your plans for your site visit in Winnipeg, Lou, but you should, uh, or if you can, see if anyone can help you get to the Narcisse snake pits. Oh my God, yeah, they offered, <laughs> yeah, so they offered and I was, moment. I was terrified. Oh, no, so um, that's yeah. just, like, Winnipeggers always want to take people to the snake pits. I know, I know, they were like, do you want to go see this? And I was like, I don't know. Not today, okay, <laughs> um, fair. I'm really excited, it's really interesting, <laughs> but yes. Are there questions from the audience? Jimmy, thanks. Hello. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. Um, uh, oh God, I'm blanking. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I I've been working with archives for a while within my own practice. Um, but I recently been engaging with the text um, "No Archive Will Restore You" by Julieta Singh. Okay, I don't know it, but it's a good read. You read should it. definitely check it out. Um, but so, but yeah, as a person who's like been working with archives a lot and now like kind of beginning to read this text and like kind of rethinking like why am I using archives so much and like wondering like is it because I really want to or is it because I've been in so many spaces where I feel like no one will listen to what I'm invested in unless I have this archive to back me up mm -hmm. um and so like yeah wondering um like having feelings of like it's still like something I'm interested in, but like navigating this like dy dynamic of like outside pressures and then like what I want mm -hmm. or need from this text, or maybe it's not from this like collection. And then like from where do I go then? Because that's all I've been know or felt like I knew this whole time. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that's something you've like butt up against within your own research. Um, or things, yeah, projects yeah. that you've worked with. Yeah, thanks for that. I pre I appreciate that. And like, I think this question around archives, you know, and like kind of starting to really talk about what it means to work with archives. I mean, I mean, many people are talking about it, but like, I think, you know, we see a lot of work that's based in archives or we sort of talk, like the archive is like a kind of hot, a hot topic in some ways, you know, and, and this, I like the, all of the kind of questions around like what does it mean to collect and who collects and like mm -hmm. and what does it mean to like reactivate and like how can we how can we read something from the past and like you know all these all these things um I think are like yeah they're things that I'm stumbling through um I feel like for me there's a I I can hear what I really hear what you're saying about that idea of like a kind of um like a like a, a kind of authority in the archive. I think uh, for me, I've often looked at archives that like sit outside of an authority, like an authorial authoritarian structure. You know, like Robin's archive in some ways was the most established archive that I've looked at, where because he has taken the time to create it in his own. But you know, it's like his own sort of personal collection, and it's like also annotated with his own personal experiences. Um, but I think, you know, like for me, the archive, like when I think about archives, I think more about a kind of like continuum or community that I'm leaning on or like a sort of like, yeah, like a kind of, a kind of like series of things that have like a series of record, like a series of actions or like a kind of series of, of histories that I can kind of lean back on and sort of, yeah, and, and to participate with and engage with. When I think about archives, the thing that I start thinking about a lot is like time and like this question of like past and future and present and like how it is that we kind of have organized that, that like there's a past, there's a future, there's a present. And that in an archive that like, you know, that kind of gets compacted in a way or that there's ways to compact it or there's ways to just not think about it as the past, but that it, you know, that like, as we encounter it, 
it still continues to impact the present and the future. And so I guess that's like been part of my interest and excitement. But yeah, I, I think like it, responding kind of more like directly to what you're saying when it feels like you need to have an authority, like an authority to back up an experience that's like, um, that's that's real, <laughs> that's really real. And and something that does constrain, yeah, constrains like uh, the work that we can make, I think. So yeah, yeah, interesting questions. And I will totally, yeah, definitely gonna read that. We can Thanks. pass you a PDF as part of yeah. our hospitality. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But, Not on record. <laughs> uh, less than 30% of the book, of course. Um, there's something also with how you, you talk about your scores, Lou, and the way that you work with them as part of your work that seems archival as, as like a prompt, right? So like, Joni, you were remarking on the archival aspect that Julieta Singh talks about, where it's like the authority and the proof and the objective evidence of a thing happened, cared for and cataloged in a very particular way. But the way that you work with translation and indexing in a certain extent um, introduces like the slippage of legibility almost in a way that could be archival, but also isn't like it. There's that, like how Ariel Twist called it, the lacuna of the pieces that um, are coming through. And that seems very important where there's this opening up of space to experience and be legible or not. And to, yeah. Ex explore that yeah yeah the, and the lacuna that the um this idea of like the lacuna and the space between translation is a like that's a space that i have thought about quite a bit and that you know that that in some ways i mean lacuna as like a word comes from this word it comes from the idea of lake um that has to share the etymological root and this idea that there's this kind of like body of water between translation and that that's the space that you sort of have to wade through and and be within when you are like trying to trying to think about past and future or like sort of however you're thinking about it records and and mm -hmm. re performances and so on so that yeah that space i think is a, a really potent space for mm -hmm. for me and uh and yeah, probably more like more where my excitement about something that happened in the past comes from, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. how does it, yeah. But I also got like really nerdily excited about, I don't know if you've, yeah, like really like nerdily excited about Karen Barad and like kind of some of the stuff that they were talking about around as much as I can grasp it, like around um, time and like sort of thinking about time in relation to, to like, quantum physics, I guess, mm -hmm. and this idea that that past and present and future are like not not linear, but that there mm -hmm. is this kind of like mixing of them. And uh, yeah, and that like score for me and like lacuna and like this kind of slippery way of reading through archives feels like it's like within that thinking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that. Are there other questions, Megan? Hey Lou. Hi. Thank you for your talk. It was really great. Um, my question's kind of related to Maya's question, um, but uh, you were talking about the like notations and notational forms. Um, and I was just curious about like how you think about kind of like a threshold of understanding, both for yourself but also for your potential viewers. Yeah, maybe. Can, can you say a bit more about that? Like, like when you're talking about a threshold of understanding, like, how do you, like... I like, guess, like, in terms of, like, legibility. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which Maya mentioned and yeah. you were talking about earlier. Yeah. Um, And just how that's kind of, like, a space for play and, like, it yeah. invites a lot of, like, interpretation yeah. and that, in turn, like, creates opportunities for iteration. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, I think that idea of legibility is something that I... I mean, I have this embodied experience of like having to render myself legible and the difficulties of rendering yourself legible. And uh, and so it becomes a space that I like, I, yeah, like I'm just, I'm super interested in it in terms of um, a space to kind of like push and like work with. Um, and I guess like, I guess that question of like like and it maybe comes out in the pas de deux piece like quite like quite strongly and there's like some other works that I've made about this this question around like how we are both like understood by language and how we can kind of like make ourselves understood by language you know and and so 
when when you're sort of thinking about this idea of like you know you walk around the street and you're like you're hailed into language mm -hmm. sorry for the you know the the like critical theory terms but like you're hailed into language and so someone's like hey man or like hey what like hey however you know or whatever they choose to tell like kind of call you and that becomes how you are um like kind of, kind of like makes you in that moment right and so we're like always sort of being made and like unmade by the language that is addressing us and like sort of the language that we are also using to like define ourselves um but then of course there's also this like space outside that where there is also you know there is also like it, what is that space outside of language I guess and like that's kind of where I'm really curious and where I sort of yeah like where I sort of see this queer potential or this kind of like and I mean I use the word queer like quite loosely but like you know this idea of like slippery or like slippage space that that doesn't have to be a like a linear like a space of linear meaning or like linear translation um but I think like also more literally like this idea of like legibility in the work like my work is in some ways quite cryptic uh and I I don't always explain everything in the work like the work can be kind of like sparse in some ways you know where you just see you see this sort of like these t-shirts and you know maybe there's like some didactic about it but like I guess for me, um, I'm interested in the idea that people encounter the scores or they can encounter the work, like, you know, in some ways, like just for for what they are, like sort of like for evidence and that it's not that I need to, like that it's not that I need to like construct this entire experience for them, but like that, that like this evidence then is what remains. And so, yeah. I, but that's something that I really, I really struggle with sometimes where I'm like, am I over explaining? Am I under explaining? I give a lot of artist talks. And then when I'm talking with people, work, people are like, oh, that's what, oh, okay. You know, and like some people are like, I needed more information. So, and that's a, I mean, it's a balance and it's like kind of learning like the poetics of your practice too and being like, what am I willing to tell, say? And like, what do I want to leave oblique? Um, and there's a certain point in which like, there's part of me where I'm like, there's like a there's a kind of queer experience, you know, say in that pas de deux piece, there's like a queer experience that I'm trying to talk about that like you you might be able to like I'm trying to give access into and the experience is not something that is like easy to say in language like mm -hmm. the, the whole point is that there's not language to talk about those those spaces so mm -hmm. so you know then people are like I, I wasn't sure and it's like well yeah that's part of it like you know yeah part of the experience of it so yeah but it, it's a question for sure yeah do you think part of that is also needing to unlearn what how well ooh, I'm, I'm stopping myself from making a dig about high school pedagogy <laughs> but um high school like uh, teaching is, is great like but i'm thinking specifically about how you're trained to read at that at that level in that time and I'm speaking also from my personal experience here but you know this is how you read an essay this is how you read a poem this is the argument and then you're tested on that ability to read things in a very particular way and then the invitation of like oh there is no single way to read a poetic text like meaning is expansive can feel an, like an overwhelming moment mm. That feels really unfair to high school no, teaching. No, but, but well, I will just say, like, I I actually sp spent some time teaching high school. Um, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> and and preparing <laughs> preparing students for their comprehensive exam or like the like you know yeah, in yeah, Nova Scotia they have to write like a standardized exam at the end of the year. Yeah, I yeah. was teaching the last chance high school, like, last chance English class in uh, in uh, high school. So it was like people who had like maybe not passed the first time or like we're not going on to academic study they were like there just to get out of high school and so you know with a standardized test and I can say this now because I'm not employed by the school board I just took the test and I was like here it is we're going to do this we're going to figure out how to do this so you can pass and get on with your lives mm -hmm. so we had to read poetry <laughs> and I was a new teacher so someone was like you should have them read the crem cremation of Sam McGee I don't know if you know this poem it's like it's a rhyming poem about it's it's dumb but um anyways we were reading it and the kids were just like this to me and then at one point one of the students just like he stood up and he slammed his book down and he was like I don't like poetry and I don't think you like poetry either and I was just like oh god like I love poetry more than 
anything like that is like the whole re I mean which is why I just like I can't work in a school system but um also just you know that idea that like that that there's like a certain way of um interpreting that is so is just so like depressing <laughs> and that and I think that is you know there's like a kind of reaction in, in a lot of my work to that of just being like yeah what like not allowing language in or sort of like creating boundaries around where language can come in because language there I have a piece that part of it talks about like I am I am made in language and I am betrayed by language because it's like you know this whole idea of like language being so much of how what shapes our experiences and and so much of like uh and so much of what betrays us as queer people and so yeah I there is like a, a bit of a reaction there it's funny I've never thought about it I was just like oh yeah that terrible moment when I quit teaching <laughs> in my brain I still showed up but that was when I was like this isn't for me <laughs> yeah are there any other questions from the audience Erin thank you and then I see your hand there we'll come to you next um speaking of maybe a, requ a request to talk a little bit more about one of the works oh yeah sure. um I didn't I'm sorry I don't know its title but it was the last it was what you ended on and I the think it's one of yeah. rites, rites yeah. passage um if you could just talk a little bit more about it I, I think one thing I was trying to understand a little bit more is um via all of the things that you have just discussed um, around translation, legibility, um, the use of scores, mm -hmm. and and the, uh, it's my first introduction to your work, but um, the arc of performance that ha has met those different ideas, um, your turn to drag. I know, yeah. Um, and I, I'm just very curious about it, um, which I feel like is harder to I mean, drag is so many things and so many different histories, but um, the like, maybe as an essence, it's like interest in over performance um, or the hyper performance. And um, I just wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that and maybe what it was like for you. I'm, I didn't see this work at uh, Diagonal, but um, it seems like a quieter piece. And that piece yeah. seems like something in a really different range. And just because we just saw like a okay. one or two minute clip, I'm just like, do you so obviously it was a performance and scored and there was a script and all of this but how how long is it is it like really main made just for the screen at this point or is it something oh, yeah, to also yeah. be performed and yeah those I'll, are just some questions ahead. yeah no totally and i apologize like i do this to myself where i like over populate my talk <laughs> and then i'm like i don't have time to really get into this um but maybe i'll just put it here and so um yeah, some really lovely things to kind of talk on. And one thing I will say, just before I get dig into this piece is like, this is really new work for me. This is work that I'm still digesting and that like, that like I made in a way of like wanting to move a little bit more into a space of like play or like just like really to kind of push my practice a little bit and say like, what what happens if I actually really lean into this idea of this like, this like larger than life performance happening in a space um, and really like occupying an entire space. So the piece started, uh, Michael Miranda, who's the curator, is like a real interest in sound. And, uh, and I have worked consistently in sound in my practice and, the, and uh, he wanted me to really come into the, this particular gallery space and think about the resonance of the gallery space. It's like a, it's like a really hard space to work in. They're actually tearing this gallery down I think the last show has just gone up in it um and then they will they will build a new space and part of the issue with the space is it's like this long hallway and it's a hundred feet long and when you're standing in it you can like not talk to somebody side by side if you're like once the work's installed in it like the, the acoustics change but like when it's empty the the space like has so much reverb that you can't actually speak like side by side and so he was like hey do you want to come in and make a piece and like really think about this like the amplification of this space and like play with that so um so that's kind of like <laughs> the the piece that's the piece kind of started there and then I had done this other work that was about tracing pathways of movement through the city of Richmond and um looking at rivers that had been uh infilled or like lost but that these could still be sort of rights right of ways through the city um and that you might be able to kind of move through those spaces 
or like follow those spaces as these kind of like right of ways and and questioning sort of like you know I can think thinking a little bit about public and private property and like movement um etc so I so I brought that kind of those two ideas together in this piece and I had been working a little bit with other performers and and working a little bit with this idea of drag and like moving back from the idea of drag as like kind of how and like it, taking liberties with it, but like moving back from the idea of drag as like sort of uh, as like maybe the the performance of it so much, and really playing with the idea of drag as as again like this sort of slippery space of like becoming, you know, where something is like someone is is like performing something um, and putting something on, but they are also like sort of they're sort of caught in this space of like of uh, of like being something else, but then also like hyper performing that that thing, and so just like really playing in that space, and I can see like I'm like, am I explaining this well? I don't know, but but you know like that was sort of where my interest was is this like idea of like what does it mean to kind of uh, be in that like really like like act, like sort of uh, like heightened space of performance, and so I had been thinking about you know like questioning kind of this idea of like human and like really reading a lot of stuff around like post-humanism and like thinking about like how do we think of ourselves as human and how do we undo this kind of like legacy of like being human and and how that kind of uh like has its like kind of roots in performance as well and sort of like the idea of like you know Shakespeare invented the human and like all of these questions around like what does it mean to kind of like think of ourselves as these individuals and and relate to the world in this way and so I wanted to really play with the structure of performance and that's like really where the like where the work kind of came together is just like playing with this idea of like the slipperiness of performance and like just really putting putting ourselves in a space of like always like performing it's obvious that you're performing because you're performing this kind of like nonsense language generated by the AI but like there's also such sincerity in the performance but it is also like you know you're dragging a plant or maybe the plant's dragging you so it's like this kind of like there's like sort of like it's ridiculous but then it's also like just really trying to talk about that slippery place of like of, of all of that um and so yeah and so that's like really like I think what what holds the work and it is a really it's unfortunate because the work is not a, it's not meant for screen there are three monitors set up and each monitor is occupied by a different performer but the work is like really specific to that space um because it's meant to be like totally immersive and you go in and like part of the idea is that you're like in this riverbed and you're kind of like in this space and you're just being uh like taken taken through this like I mean there is like a kind of narrative arc to it. it's an hour long piece that you know you can sit through but the idea is that you're just kind of entering in and out of this like space that it's always sort of slipping slipping in and out of like legibility I guess in some ways so um so yeah it's a big it's a big piece yeah and, and probably probably in a year or two I'll be like that piece is about blah 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 and <laughs> you know when I talk about some of the older work like when I first started making a strong desire which is like to me now I'm like it's so clear how I can speak about that succinctly um the piece like the the gender dysphoria piece when I was making it I was like oh. and now I've processed it for like five years and I'm like oh yeah like I, I can see very clearly like how it how it functions um but even like making pas de deux it, here in Montreal this week like I was watching the performers and I was like ah like that's what's happening or like that's where I'm you know like we learn like I think so often like we don't know exactly where our practices are taking us and then we get there and then we have to look back and be like okay that's that's where I like that's where I am or something yeah but yeah do, do you work are you have an interest in drag are you a drag I, I don't need to out you as a drag performer are you a drag performer <laughs> Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. 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 It's uh yeah, I I mean it's it, it, whenever you engage with histories like this and histories that come out of like intersections of communities, it's like um yeah, you're engaging with like an entire history that like, you know, and I'm I'm not I'm only like just one sort of person kind of playing with it, but 
I think it's yeah that's that's my excitement about it is is uh is this idea that it's like kind of sits in this space of like always becoming or something so yeah yeah thanks I rambled through that one a little we were with you <laughs> uh are you okay for one more question Lou I'd sort of promised one more yeah 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 yeah, yeah. you're all right okay yeah. No, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Am I starting to? I'm starting to show signs of wear. No, no. <laughs> I'm like, oh God, I don't know why. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Margaret. I'm a MA art history visitor. Oh. Okay. <laughs> and I'm looking at architecture okay. and been reading more about post-human, non-human, mm -hmm. and really interested in what you were saying about visiting this site of extraction and then the built environment or the building as that extraction in a form yeah and wondered if you could talk a bit more about how that building or those elements how the building is a collaborator or is the building itself a collaborator in the score or how you encounter a building yeah. is it through movements or writing um, just more your how do you feel about <laughs> building the building yeah. and how do you is I know you were talking about archive is that the first place you go or, or do you like to go to the actual wall of the building I think I got yeah I I won't talk about that piece because it's not made yet and I just I just suddenly like it was literally laying in bed the other night and just being like oh that's how I like this is you know that just I, I can see that there's a link here um but what I will talk about maybe is a piece that I didn't get to into, which is this work, which is a collaborative work. So I've been collaborating over the last couple of years uh, with this artist, Will Robinson, who is also from the East Coast um, and also works with scores. And he and I kind of came up together in our like undergrads and we've, um, we've always wanted to work together. And then we just had this opportunity to, because it's like, we're coming up on the 50 year anniversary of all these, uh, all these buildings these uh, buildings that are purpose built for art spaces, usually around universities or like sort of municipal buildings um, that were built like uh, around the 70s. And I think they were built, yeah, it was like the centennial, the Canadian centennial at that point. I think that they were, they sort of like all came up and then now they're all 50 years old and everyone wants to either tear them down or like to commemorate them. So, uh, so we had this opportunity to go into the Dalhousie Art Center, which is uh, a kind of funny, example of um, metabolist architecture. It's a really interesting building. If you're in Halifax, you should totally check it out. Um, and we responded to that building and responded to the architectural uh, movement of the building um, through like this kind of exhibition. And, uh, and then we moved on to the, this piece that we're kind of working on right now that will be placed in the Confederation Center uh, in PEI in March. And this is an image of the Confed Center. Um, and uh, in PEI and it's like a kind of funny building because it's it's the Confederation Center for the Arts it has a theater the theater plays many things but it often plays Anne of Green Gables um like they 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 stage Anne of Green Gables every year it's incredible like the longest running like stage show in east of Montreal I don't know anyways um that's a joke for people that live in the east coast we always say like this is the only one east of Montreal um doesn't matter. You guys aren't from East of Montreal. So, uh, so the Confed Center is like really a wacky building and it's, uh, it's both an art center and a monument to Confederation, right? Like it's, it occupies both spaces and it's this four, it's like five pavilions, I think. Um, and they are these sort of like separated pavilions, like big concrete blocks, like super classic brutalist architecture. And, uh, and so we've been going in to kind of think about like, how do we talk about the building itself and kind of uh, respond to that site and also talk about this history, like the, the history that it's monumentalizing or that it's, that it's uh, sort of meant to remind us of, which is like the kind of history of Confederation of Canada. So, uh, I, so the way that I, like the way that I was approaching it um, and we will sort of like when we were working together we often kind of sit down and like agree on an idea together and then we split it we say like you take this idea and I'll take this idea and we kind of run with them and then we keep bringing them back together and banging them into each other and being like does this still go together yeah okay like take it away bring it back and that's our collaborative process um which I think yeah 
as both as like really independent thinkers. I think it's like the way that we figured out to work together. But uh, I wanted to really think about this history of like performance around confederation and like all of the songs and like plays and scores and like like etc that were performed to kind of convince people to come on board to confederation or to celebrate it and uh and to think about the building as kind of like holding those like that sound so what i will be doing is creating a like a kind of an extended piece based on this like this historic music um and shifting it in some ways and then playing it into the building and recording the the way that the building like adds its own resonance and the, the way that the sound begins to kind of resonate and deteriorate in the building um and so the the installation will be that piece played and recordings of like everyone that comes through the gallery added to it so that it becomes a sort of like you know that the building becomes an instrument of itself and that we also can kind of like look at look at that history of confederation like through a kind of present as, and like sort of think about like you know how do we sort of yeah like how do we hear it now and like like what is sort of how do we yeah how do we listen now i guess to mm -hmm. that I, that history um and will is working with the idea of erosion on pei and if you know pei it's like eroding at a rate of one foot a year that's <laughs> wild um so like it yeah it loses like one one foot of coastline every year uh and recently more during the last storm um, and so he's working with this idea of like deterioration and like, so both of us are kind of in some ways talking about like, like the ways that spaces fall apart. And so the building itself then becomes this kind of like, like we're treating it like this idea of like, it, that it's, yeah, that it's kind of like, uh, both like, it is kind of falling apart in itself, or like we're kind of asking it mm -hmm. to fall apart when we listen to what happens in it. So that I would say like we, we visited the building first. Um, we were invited in by the curator. We came in. We like took a walk through it. We like take photos. Uh, we sort of drink coffees, you know, like the dilettantes probably, and just like and and then we kind of and then I was like, I want to think, you know, like I was like, I want to really think about like, like yeah, all the performances that have happened here and mm -hmm. and like sort of this idea of performance here. And so I went to archives with that. And I will say, Will and I, because we have like, uh, we're, su we're supported by generously by the Canada, Canada Council for the Arts, we're able to hire a research assistant to go and into our archives. And so we have somebody that we've worked with previous moments that we really trust and who also is like really implicated in the in the projects and they know how to find us information. So like they can kind of go through these archives and pull things out that they know are going to be interesting to us. And, um, and often I'm looking for like floor plans of the building because I will use the floor plans of the building to kind of determine the score. Like I'll use that as a kind of cue for the score uh, that I create for the music that's performed in the building. Um, and like, I want to know about like, I also am always really interested in details like, what did they serve at like this confederation <laughs> brunch? And like, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Cause I just think that's like the kind of details that you can wormhole into so yeah that's that's like maybe a, an architecture project we're hoping to do something at habitat 67 if anyone has a place there <laughs> yeah that's like kind of a dream like a pipe dream so and that would be the like our, kind of wrapping that series of work up because we've been at it for a while yeah yeah cool good last question <laughs> yeah um and so i have the happy task lou of allowing you to leave the spotlight, uh, but to welcome a round of thanks. Uh, thank you so much for that really generous talk. Thank you. Ah, thanks, everybody. I, yeah, it's, I really hope to hear more about what you're thinking about and working on. And, um, and yeah, it's like, I'm not a, yeah, I, I, I guess I like, you know, we all just do these things and we try to figure mm -hmm. out what we're doing. And, and I'm happy to share that with you. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I appreciated that honest moment where you see, seem to suggest that you can also change your mind about what you're thinking about your own work. Oh yeah. And that's such an important permission to give yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And you might hate something when you make it. And then like later you're like, that was really good or like vice versa. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> 
so let's gossip about that over drinks and pizza, shall we, for those who wish. Uh, but I want to make a few quick important thanks before we leave the room. Thank you to your good selves for coming out this evening, uh, trudging through the snow. I also want to thank the Zoom audience um, and Josh in the booth. Smooth tech is always attentive tech. And to Ada and Karen who help with the publicity and event stuff with Sika. Um, and the uh, future bartender who might give us something to wet our whistles. So the logistic is um, where you are going to go up to Grumpy's, which is the choice uh, student bar on Bishop. Um, and uh, usually we just gravitate towards the backish room and I'm going to order pizzas. I tend to get a mix of meat uh, selection and vegetarian selection. But if you're coming along and have any dietary preferences or requirements, just let me know. And uh, we can continue the chats there with Lou and whoever feels able and wishes to join us. But thanks again for coming to the chat. Ah, thank you. <laughs> can I just